Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, and welcome to the session on carbon sequestration, but also uh, circulation of carbon and other nutrients. So it's quite a wide topic, and I will chair this session, but I will also start with my own presentation. So uh, first presentation today in this session would be Pyrechar as a promising tool for carbon sequestration effects on the environment and agriculture. Um, and we have here today also Juve from our team, PhD student, and Mina Kjani, and they have also contributed to these results and also other members of the research group. So to start off, I would like to ask you why was yesterday an important day globally? Anyone? Of course, in addition to that, our conference started yesterday. Sorry? This year's resources? Yes, exactly. So, yesterday, 2nd of August, it was the all time earliest uh, overshoot day. So, it's the day that we use as much resources as nature can renew for this year, 2017. And much of this ecological footprint comes from greenhouse gases, global change. And actually the only way we can uh, reach the target rise in global temperature less than 2 degrees can be if we use carbon sequestration technologies. And there are many of these, but the sustainable use of biochar is actually one of the most efficient and most promising in these terms. And there is a recent paper uh, published in Nature Communications last year. I will share the slides with you so you can click on the links and, and you will see this uh, showing why this biochar is more efficient than this injection of um, CO2 into, for example, oceans. Biochar, what is it? Basically, Biomass heated without oxygen. The process is called pyrolysis. But what distinguishes it from charcoal is its use. So it's used in a way that does not allow rapid mineralization of this photosynthetically fixed CO2 back to the atmosphere. So if we have charcoal, we use it for barbecue or energy creation. This is not biochar by definition. During this Pyrolization process, the aromatic compounds uh, condense. This makes biochar highly stable against microbial degradation. So, if we mix uh, biochar with soils, it stays there for thousands of years thanks to its aromatic nature. And it has been calculated. That we could sustainably sequester as much as 1.8 gigatons of carbon annually with sustainable biochar practices. Whereas alternative practices using more short term uh, carbon additions to soils can reach only 1.5 gigatons. These are, for example, uh, organic fertilizers, agroforestry, everything. Also very important, but this carbon is very short-lived. It's very quickly in a few years, maybe 10 years, released back to the atmosphere. But if it's condensed, aromatic compounds are condensed, it is stable and stays there for thousands, hundreds and thousands of years. And if you're more interested in the potential of biochar in power sequestration, I warmly recommend you to check out this Professor Johannes Lehmann's uh, presentation in Morocco. This link is also here in the presentation, uh, where he presented especially this issue, biochar use versus this uh, injecting carbon into oceans and geological strata. However, biochar use is not by any means a new concept. Uh, this kind of historical 
black soils, the red soils, have been found in central Amazonia already 3,000 years ago, dated back. And there are theories that this fertile dark soil, compared to adjacent uh, acid, nutrient poor, uh, yellowish soil, may have even been the uh, basis of the famous El Dorado legend. So nothing about gold, but something more, even more valuable. A method for making infertile soil fertile, and thus facilitating civilization in China. Similar dark soils have been found also in Finland, neighboring areas called Kuta, Kutis, for example, in Estonia, and also date back to at least 1500 years. These soils have more carbon, uh, more nutrient, water available for plants, higher uh, pH, and also often uh, microbial community. And they can sustain higher yields. And what is interesting, even these days, one can see in Brazil that they still sell, sell these soils that Indians created a thousand years ago. So they go shovel a little bit to truck and sell as a potting media to load soils into cities. So something very long term. So this question, can we replicate the Terra Preta phenomenon with new biochar additions nowadays, has been one of the main motivations for biochar research in recent years. And as you can see, the biochar research is really mushroom. But also, uh, the other motivation for that has been the agricultural and environmental benefits that have inspired the recent research. Also, in our research group, uh, the blog, what we have, we started as a small Nordic blog. To our surprise, we have had visitors from 80 countries already. So, this is a place for several presentations and, and articles and news about biochar. So, if you're interested, please check it out. How is biochar produced? It can be a very small scale, very low tech. Uh, cover the soil to, to take off the oxygen. Here you see some very small uh, kills, or it can be already industrial scale uh, devices, for example, the Sonnenerde company. Uh, this, both this Contiki and Sonnenerde links are leading to YouTube videos which you can see if you're interested in how this process goes. And of course there is a question of product certification. So if we have so different production facilities, they must produce very different materials. That is exactly true. That's why we should talk about biochars, not about biochar. So to say that biochar does this and for that is the same as to say that fertilizer all fertilizers are very different, also all biochars are different. And nowadays there is certification on its way, first starting with European Biochar Certificate, which is volunteer certificate. There is a positive list for feedstock, criteria for material properties, so it has to contain at least half carbon. And thresholds for heavy metals, contaminants like BAHs, and so on. The next step going forward for our characterization of biochar itself is if we add it. So, of course, before we use any kind of biochar, we should very carefully characterize it. But the next step is if we add it to soil, what does it actually do? So, very similar to the energy efficiency labels that you see on washing machines or whatever household equipment. Uh, there is current under development IBI, International Biosher Initiative, Biosher Classification 2, where they have similar systems. So, carbon storage classes, how efficient it is in carbon sequestration, uh, how many nutrients can fertilize uh, value, lining classes, 
and particle size classes, which gives a proxy for effects on soil physical properties. So, uh, so much about the introduction. Now, a few words about cases. We have long term field experiments going on uh, here in Helsinki because before we uh, go into wide scale application of biochar, one main uh, research gap is what it actually affects, how does it affect the soil, uh, biota, the plants, what happens there in the environment. And we started this in 2010, so today is finishing eighth growing season in rain. These are one of the most long-term field experiments in the world. Uh, Biochar we used uh, based on softwood, spruce or pine chips, paralyzed at 550 degrees, and quite fine particles, so almost 90% less than 5 millimeters. And very important, if one starts to work with biochar, it is to moisturize it. Otherwise, there is gun with the wind issue, so you should never apply biochar dry. We have used about 20-30% moisture content. And then you see it really goes where it's intended to go to the field experiment. This is what the field looked like after application. And after rotary power harrowing, we saw crops. And after mixing it with soil, you actually cannot even say what is, where is this 30 ton biochar application. And then we harvested the crops. And we are continuing these experiments. So, a few words about the results. We found, of course, increased carbon content, uh, but also potassium content. So. The nutrients uh, effect is very much dependent on the raw material. However, the other nutrient effects were not significant, probably because very uh, rather high initial pH, the pH was 6.4 or greater initially, and also very high organic matter content. So we had about 3% uh, of carbon in the soil initially. So the added biochar acts very much uh, similarly as um, biochar, as the initial uh, carbon or organic matter in soil. So thus the bigger effects are to be expected in soils with less than 1% carbon. And also the uh, nutrients other than potassium were rather low availability. Attempt to soil the properties. Uh, we found increased uh, available water content and also in some cases also increased soil moisture but this 30 tons per hectare addition uh, effect was still quite low. Uh, then 2012 we found reduced bulk density and porosity uh, but in most cases we did not see significant effects on soil moisture content. So this supports the conclusion that biochar effects on physical properties, soil physical properties are dose dependent. So a critical amount, minimum amount is needed for effects being significant. And they affect more on macropores on soil than micropores. Then we also looked on soil biota. Uh, we had uh, urea working on 2015, but first we had another uh, study after the first growing season. And even though the earth warm density uh, was trend-wise bigger, so almost double, but the variability in the field experiment is still quite high, so those uh, effects were not statistically significant. And also, so this was about uh, after first growing season, and also after second, uh, fifth grade growing season, so in 2015 we had no significant effects in earth intensity. Uh, in that study, interestingly, we found that earthworms had ingested biochar, so we collected also earthworm casts and looked into uh, the black carbon content of these casts. So clearly biochar is safe in terms of earthworms are not avoiding it. And we are currently working with a stream hard job for uh, 
uh, focusing on the microbial community structure changes after biochar addition over long term. Then about crop uh, yields. In the first uh, seven growing seasons, we had no significant effects on crop yields. Uh, and also no significant interaction with fertilizer addition. And this is quite similar to other uh, short-term results from non-field experiments. Uh, Richard et al. studied this. So in 80% of cases they had no significant effect, 12% increase and 6% increase. Uh, in the last autumn, so a year ago, we had something very interesting. Uh, first time I saw some visual effect on this high organic matter uh, soils uh, in case of peas. So uh, here are not the lowest fertilizer level and here is the highest fertilizer level. So it seemed that without biochar fertilizer reduced the yield, but with biochar it was the opposite effect. So something interesting is going on there after seven growing seasons, maybe about biological nitrogen fixation or microbial community. We are working on it, what might it be. However, the final yields, even though uh, if we compare this bar with this bar, there is 30% yield increase, still it was not statistically significant because in field experiments we had another big variation. So, another case, uh, what we are working on, uh, Biosharing environmental engineering. We try, can it be of help in developing best practice for lake restoration and sediment recycling? So we know that phosphorus reaches water bodies, causes eutrophication, but what to do with the phosphorus already in the water bodies? So we have a case study lake, heavily eutrophicated, currently being uh, restored. And we use, after this uh, restoration, we use biochar filters near the lake side to catch nutrient inflow. So this is part of the best practice and we are having also field experiment to see how does this affect. And we also have a lysinator experiment where we have pure soil and pure sediment, so just top dress sediment and then different levels of top soil on top of sediment to see uh, and one treatment here with biochar as well to see uh, models what would be the best method of applying uh, <coughs> sediment from the water bodies which is phosphorus rich to the agriculture and we have some few First results about that, if you are interested in more details, please check out Mina's poster in the poster session tonight. A uh, few uh, first results from the lysimeter study found that Bioshi reduced the leachate volume. So here is the volume for third cut, and here is the treatment with Bioshi, so almost all no leachate coming out. Whereas the pure soil and uh, pure sediment have much more. And the first effects on biomass were not significant, but some promising trends there as well. And in addition, we have this field experiment on the lake shore. And this is also under development, so we will explore there many other things, for example, root growth, nutrient leaching, and microbial community structure. Then, a uh, third case very promising uh, results from Nepal. Recycled nutrients with help of urine activated biochar. So they are collecting urine from cattle um, parts and also some first schools have started to close nutrient cycles in villages. So the farmers send their children to school and get nutrients back to use in their fields. And this urine is used for activating still hot biochar uh, and 
so it loads also with nutrients. And here are a few results from pumpkin yield, for example, published two years ago, where they had triple yield with this URI biochar uh, treatment compared to URI only or biochar only. So very promising results. And the best practice of applying biochar has been developed all the time recent years and currently this hot activation of biochar and uh, adding it not broadcasting to the fields but directly next to the plant roots is the best practice. And something very inspiring also about urban biochar applications. Our neighbor capital here capital of Sweden, Stockholm, uh, aims very ambitiously to be carbon neutral by 23 year time from now. And they are doing this with help of biochar. So this April, three months ago, they opened their first biochar plant. So the concept is that um, city uh, people bring their green waste, carbon waste, there to this uh, facility and in addition, uh, in the return they get biochar, what they can use for planting trees or if they got carbon. And if you are interested, please check out this stockholmbutton.c website. Uh, City of Stockholm has been using with very good results uh, biochar in planting trees. So they have this kind of mixture of uh, stones and biochar and Pierre uh, Embrand is the person responsible for tree planting and I was happy to see that uh, two years ago they really had very nice tree growth so people all over the world come there and, and learn how to do the uh, best practice in this kind of uh, structural soils. And also Helsinki, like a few years after, but starting now, first test streets, Isadova and Mechelin Kato, in this and next year of biochar treatments there. Uh, one main uh, thing hindering the wide scale use is still quite high price of biochar. And here one method would be cascaded use of biochar. For example, if it's first added as a feed additive, 1-2% of the feed intake for cattle has shown very good results in Switzerland. Uh, then it naturally becomes a medic amendment, and then a composting amendment, and only finally the same biochar reaches soil. So this kind of cascading use of biochar could be one method for improving the Economy. To conclude, biochar is a safe tool for sequestering carbon and improving soil physical chemical properties. The best effects, though, are seen on coarse and low organic matter soils, but also acid and nutrient deficient soils. And the effects depend very much on biochar, so the material has to be characterized well before application. Biochars increase soil carbon, potassium and water content. But of course, if the uh, soil is originally rather high in carbon, then no uh, significant yield improvements in the first years should be expected. Uh, of course, different story is then with these uh, hot activated biochars, which have, to my knowledge, still not been tested under boreal conditions. So this is the new best practice. We are really interested to look into that. So, towards best practice, uh, biochar should be activated when still hot with liquid fertilizers uh, to apply near the roots, so not broadcasting. Of course, uh, using uh, more in high value crops. And then, uh, when restorating water bodies, uh, it is advisable to use biochar filters to capture nutrients along the waterways. 
Now, if you got interested, want to learn more, there are a few recent bunch of books. This is called the Biochemical Bible, almost thousand pages, uh, second edition, 2015. Then Biochemical European Soils and Agriculture, uh, published last year, and now uh, the final publication of the European Cost Action Biochemical. Uh, this network of European researchers and companies. This final publication is also out now, and this link there uh, brings you to this publication. Uh, with these words, I would like to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please.